and it was called it, the, the exhibition itself was 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 run by um, Paolozzi, the Smithsons who were architects, and of course Richard Hamilton, and it was called This Is Tomorrow. And it, for the first time, you're going, I've got some images of it. And the very first time we saw people, you, uh, uh, museums showing uh, popular art. I mean, art that was basically, um, uh, you know, taken from, from magazines and so on. And, and this is what, if you put the first one on, I'll show you. Now, do you remember this very, very important poster, which was for this exhibition? And of course, it was from the Whitechapel, and 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 this 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 is this is amazing. Uh, uh, it's called "This Is Tomorrow," and and the the the, uh, the poster. You notice he's carrying in his uh, in his arms pop. That's the first time we see pop. Look at the the images rather carefully because I think there's a bit of I think that's a photograph of the moon. And of course, it's you know the, the the latest in in I suppose that's not a record player; it's a tape recorder with it on the front there, and and, and a bot and a tin of spam, and uh, the, uh, uh, in the the far back, it's the first move. It's the first talking movie, you know that one at the back there, and all of the things the new cleaner, and here on the right is his, his Hamilton's um, a part of that exhibition. And you see very carefully, you see Marilyn Monroe and you see the, a, a sort of an early robot type creature uh, clutching the girl. That, well, there was that film, wasn't it? What was the film about when I've forgotten what it was, but it was about, about this time. But they, well, there was the man who fell to earth, the base of the body snatched. Well, this, this, this is at the time. This is this is basically Fueled by the Cold War. This is incredibly hysteria. early, you see, really for the for, for the period. And you know that the, the poster, the poster actually has the most incredible stories. It says, uh, just what is it that makes today's home so different and so appealing? A funny title for the poster. Oh, of course, it's a very famous poster. Okay, next one. Now here, we've got two of the protagonists, the early people. On the front, on what we're looking at is um, Hockney's diploma show and Derek Bosher in front. Hockney at the back. Notice, at this point, he's got dark hair. And we're going to see Behind him, we're going to see one of his earliest pictures in a minute. But this is their diploma show from the Royal College. He hasn't been to America yet, so he hasn't had his hair dyed. And on the right, we've got the very, very first time that the general public began to know anything about pop art. And it was through a BBC programme, which was called Monitor. And Monitor itself, it itself was... Uh, was was uh, it, the, the 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 program itself was called Pop Goes the Easel, and what we're seeing in this image is Peter Blake's Got a Girl underneath, and the, we are now looking at the date 1962. Derek Bosher and and uh, Hockney are 1961, so we're just at the beginning of the of the new image, which was of course the beginning of of of, of pop art. Now, what I want to point out to you at this time, all of these young people that we're going to see had something very specially different in their generation from the generations before, because all of them were able to go to final education, whether it was university or whether it was art school, and they didn't pay anything. And what only did they not pay anything, they even got a sort of, not a large amount of money, but a small amount of money to live on. And this made this incredible, uh, it, almost incredible new group of people who are having, who are being, being educated at this particular point. And we're looking at the rise of what used to be called the working class. Every one of these people 
their fathers were either bakers or butchers or or they certainly were, were, were has not they were the first of their family of course to go on to university or whatever came and this is a very very important difference a monitor was showing really the general people what the new artists were doing with space okay next one let me show you and this one this one is E equally important. This particular, this particular one is 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 uh, David Bailey photographing Jean Shrimpton, and it's the first color supplement of the Sunday Times. So at the same time, you've got to so say this is again this particular one, uh, the, the first uh, the the, the, the uh, for, for this is 1962 as well, and here they are here. And on the on the right there, you've got uh, you've got uh, Mary Quant opening up her first bazaar, and that actually she opened it in fifty five. But here she is dancing and showing us about it. And she's she 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 uh, this particular photograph is nineteen sixty three, and as I say, the shrimp in the sixty two. Now we're going to see the the. The, the, the next thing we're going to see is the exhibition of, of which, which, which we're talking about. Now, this is this extraordinary exhibition, which is uh, uh, in Bermondsey, and it's a fashion exhibition. Now, now, I'm going to read, from, because, of the, because of this, I'm going to read what the, the bit that Camilla uh, photographed for me. And it says, in the summer of 1966, George Melly, visited the Aubrey Beardsley exhibition in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The perplexed writer struggled to identify the assembled visitors who gave the impression of belonging to a secret society. Months later, many realized that this youthful crowd formed part of the newly emerging underground. underground. Beardsley's illustration and the sinuous forms of Art Nouveau embodied social and sexual freedoms that challenged the prevailing societal values and would prove to be one of the counterculture's earliest formative graphic influences. While Swinging London promoted consumerism and futurism, a very different ideology was developing in parallel. The underground were arty and intellectual. They rejected materialism, seeking instead spiritual and psychedelic enlightenment. Uh, on the 11th of June, 1964-5, this alternative community congregated at the, uh, the Albert Hall for the international poetry incarnation and the arrival of the American poet, Allen Ginsberg. The counterculture had arrived. Now, this is, this is the next important bit. This alternative society included an elite group of artists aristocrats and musicians, the beautiful people, young, rich and talented. They refused to relinquish the hedonism of youth, adopting the mantra, and I remember this, turn on, tune in, drop out. Harold Wilson's Britain, where economic fear and the threat of war were absent, produced the per perfect social conditions and space for their creativity. And, and rebelliousness to flourish. And I thought that was well worth reading. But there it is, it, 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 was, it was actually designed by a Mexican architect, a man called, um, and I suddenly go, I can't see his name here, but, you know, uh, uh, Ricardo Legoreto. Le and it was inspired by Sandra Rose, and it was actually built in 2003. Now, the, the image on the right is slightly more difficult to see. And why we've put it on is because it shows you the beginnings. It was, again, it comes from the museum. And it, it's the boutiques. And you'll see them all clustered around Chelsea on the left here. The only one that isn't is the one in Paddington, which was the, the Apple one, which we'll see in a minute. But this gives you an idea of the sheer amount of them at this particular point. And it really was quite extraordinary, this movement. Now, the next thing we're going to put in, the next one we're going to put in, is, is, is the, the response to sh that, that article I showed you. Because the, fir the very first poster on the left is, I don't know who did it, I didn't write it down, 
was inspired, of course, by Art Nouveau. You could see that one. And, uh, and the middle one is the V&A uh, advertisement for Aubrey Beardsley, the one we talked about. And on the right, showing this interest in the sort of romantic point of the 19th century, that's Mick Jagger in a 19th century guardsman's uniform. And the guardsman's uniform is at, at, is at the back. And so they were buying up all this sort of thing as well. Okay, next one. Now, this is perhaps the one that one I would love to have seen. Now, this is by the, Be the Beatles now, has published their first album. They were all very, very fashionable. And they decided to have the Apple Boutique. And this is what we're looking at. And the decoration were by a, a Dutch group called The Fool. And it was painted. They didn't bother to get the... Uh, uh, the permission of the Westminster Council. So the Westminster Council promptly shut it down. It actually only lasted for one year, it started in 67, and it was already closed in 19, 1968. It, uh, 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 they had lost 200,000 pounds on it, actually. It was painted, it was designed by this group called The Fool, the Dutch people, but it was actually painted by, by art students. Now the picture on the right are some of their costumes, which you'll see if you go to this exhibition. And these were the, the one was called Maria Kroger, there was Simon Ruggiera, Yosha Leger, and these were the people who, who comprised the, uh, the, the, the Apple Boutique. As I say, it only lasted a year. Okay, next one. Now these are terribly interesting. I would urge you, by the way, if you can possibly get it's a it's a i bought it there it's a there's a, 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 a paperback and it's it's a barbara hulanke's um, autobiography and it's called bieber and i urge you to read it it's tremendously good and it explains this period tremendously well because we're, what we're looking at on the left are the clothes, our Bieber clothes at the time. Now, I never went there, but other people did. And I gather that their shops, which were started at this particular period, were sort of going into the shop was like going into somebody's front room because they were full of all sorts of um, antique chairs of goodness knows what. The one on the right is actually by Quorum. And this is exactly what, what um, Penny was talking about because this mater these material were designed by Celia Birtwell and the clothes were actually designed by Ozzie Clark. And they, they, were, they were briefly married. They were married in 1979. But this, these are actually in the exhibition. Okay, next one, and I'll show you. There, there again, I'm afraid of quorum ones. It was the best photograph I could find, but it gives you the no, idea. I took these. Do you, uh, Camilla took them, yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's why. <laughs> what I mean is, it was the best one I could find of the, of the ones you took. Uh, it was one of the most attractive, I think, because it does give you an idea of the, sh of the scale of, the, it's a rather small museum you can see on the left, but particularly notice these great, this is what Mary was talking about. Now these, of course, are much, much later. These are, these are probably 1968, 69. And the one on the extreme right was designed by Ozzy Clark, mm -hmm. and it was called the Botticelli print. And the print, of course, was designed by um, Celia Birtwell. And Celia Birtwell, as you probably all know, was the, the muse of David Hockley. And in 1970, later than we're talking about, 71, 70, 70 71, he did this marvellous painting of them in Notting Hill, and it's Mr. and Mrs. Clark and Percy, the Percy being the cat, of course. But on the right, there's that really charming watercolour that he did of Celia, and it's Celia in her dressing gown in 1971. And he still is, is, is using Celia, but it's really one of the most lovely ones. You know it's in the tape now. But it kind of describes that that space and the fact that one forgets. But at that this particular point, Notting Hill was not really a safe place to be living in in this time, and it really was the art movement that made it into the rather fashionable space that it is now. Okay, 
let's have the next one because this one I think absolutely sums up the different the class difference which was so apparent at this particular time. Now the reason I've got Games from the Blue Boy on is because it's one of the very rare opportunities we have to see it. It's been lent to the National Gallery. It's normally, normally in Huntington in California. I did see it there. And it's one of the most beautiful of Gainsborough. And you see it's a very traditional painting portrait of an upper class young man in this lovely blue suit. And I juxtapose it, of course, with Peter Blake's self-portrait with a self-portrait with badges, and it's 1961. Now, if you look at this very carefully, look at the stuff that is surrounded on the blue boy. All we've got is his hat. He's holding his hat as he's standing in his, his family's landscape. Now we look at the, the, uh, the difference between this, of course, and Peter Blake. Peter Blake's obviously at the bottom end of the garden. With a with a an open fence, look at his badges, and most especially look what he's clutching in his hand, and it's of course as, as Elvis, the copy of Elvis. Now this really is very very much very important because it describes the new the, the, the new the new people really people that were not only looking at comics and used them. For it, it for for the imagery, but they were listening to a new kind of music, which of course was the new popular music, and this is a, a very important picture for that reason. Okay, next one. He was one, of course, a man of the Monitor. Now on the left, you see, I think one of his most interesting pictures, and this is called On the Balcony. Now, if you look at this very carefully, it's worth really examining it, because here we see. The pictures on the, the in black and white, which you've taken, of course, from the newspapers, is the is the uh, the royal family on the balcony, and you see that one, and you see the the, the image of Life magazine, the children, and and most especially on the on the far left there, uh, a, a, a reproduction of Manet's balcony picture. So he's describing all of his inf his influences here. And, 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 exp and expressing his English, his Britishness, really. And on the right, which I think is one of the most tender of all of them, this top one is, is a, an early painting of his. It was done in 1954, and it's children reading comics. And this has a particular poignancy because both Peter Blake and his sister were evacuated. And this picture is, an, is, a, is a memory of this time, because unlike so many people who were very fortunate, I was fortunate when I was evacuated. I, I lived in a, a house was built, and we all lived in a school. But he went to very, very unpleasant people, and his, he and his sister had a perfectly dreadful time. And underneath it, you see the first the picture, which we've already seen, which is called Got a Girl. And that was 60, 61. And of course, this was a pop song. And look at the top, you see, they're all the young men. The, 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 I don't recognize them. It's all the various pop, pop, pop musicians, of the, I suppose, of the same, the same group. Okay, next one. Now, here we're going to see one of the most important figures. Now, I want you all, if you can, to look this lady up. She's very, very important and has been until very recently completely forgotten. She's called Pauline Boaty, and she died when she was 28. And she was one of the very, very first pop artists. In fact, she was one of the ones chosen to be in the monitor thing that we saw at the beginning. Now on the left there, you see her standing in front of her wall. Now look at this wall carefully because on this wall are all the kind of images that they, she was choosing to, 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 to use for her own painting. You see interesting connections between Cranach, you see David Hockney, you see, again, a 
photographs of magazines. And she's holding, unfortunately, a painting which has now disappeared. It's called Scandal. And of course, in a sense, what it is about, of course, is the Profumo affair. It came to public notice in 1963, and Pauline Boaty is holding it because this is what she's just painted. And of course, on the back are all the people who were involved, Profumo and all of the people that, that were in the support. Now, this was a very, very important thing that happened because it brought down the government and it brought in Wilson. And it's Wilson that we were talking about at the beginning who gave this particular period of freedom that, you know, the time when we had all the, 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 the health service, etc. Now, the picture on the right is one of the, about her, it, her personal involvement. She was, she was not working class. Her family were middle class. She came from Wimbledon. She had a, her father, I think, was, a, was an accountant. He didn't want her to be an artist. She went to Wimbledon Art School and she was very, very beautiful. And she was called the Wimbledon Brigitte Bardot because she looked awfully like Brigitte Bardot. And she says very funny things about herself. She really does say something really quite nice. Uh, she, she herself was more associated uh, to, she, she was looking at not necessarily the Americans, but she was looking really to surrealism because what I should have told you, and very importantly, was also in, 1950, in the late 1950s, 1956 again, uh, it was the first American exhibition at the Tate. And this is where we saw uh, particularly the abstract expressionists, not yet the pop artists, but people like Rothko and, and of course, Johns and so on. Uh, I think, no, not Johns. Uh, uh, people like de Kooning and... and, uh, and um, Rauschenberg? Uh, not yet. Rauschenberg came later. Okay. That was the next one. Now, she's, she's looking at, she's, she's actually looking at Rauschenberg, but she's not looking at abstract expressionism, but she particularly is not in particularly involved with the Americans. She, as I say, she was very, very pretty, but most importantly, the most, for women, perhaps the most important thing that happened in the 60s was the pill. The pill was able to be got from the net, from the, uh, uh, from the, pharmacist, the pharmacist or your GP anywhere um, in 1961. And for the first time, it gave women the freedom, the sexual freedom that men had had to all of this point. And this is what this picture is about. Now, it appears that she was referring to, she, was, she, 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 she lived sexually free free by comparison of what had gone before. And that image of the rose is what she's referring to as female, or, uh, for female, female orga orgasm. And it's on top of one of her, her, her passions, who was Jean-Paul Belmondo. And that is a collage of the photograph. And you see the heart at the top. She's describing her, 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 her particular interest. She's a terribly interesting young woman. And this particular picture uh, uh, is uh, this particular picture was 1962, and you see, uh, as I say, the the, the perfume affair by 1963 was causing all sorts of problems. Okay, next to uh, here we see an image of her wall, and as you see, you can see more clearly exactly what her her wall contained: a strain, a mixture of photographs, images from films. Her particular passion was musical, the, the American musical Hollywood films. She loved Fred Astaire and all of those dancing. She loved the music. And there's a portrait, a photograph of her. Now, the one on the right is much sadder. It's really beginning of the end of the hope and the revolutionary, early revolutionary period. Because this one, this is a collage and, and it is, it is, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's called Countdown to Violence. Now, if we look at this very carefully and we look and see what is inside, we see the picture of Kennedy and Lincoln. Kennedy by now had been killed. In the center, we see her hands, and you notice it, 
the, the, the she's cutting the rose. And what did you say about the? Why didn't you get the back? You so got, this is the a, a Buddhist monk. I didn't um, see that. I think one. I, it was this was 1963. Yeah. Uh, his Tich Quang Duk who um, committed self-immolation as a form of protest. Oh, I remember that. Now on the right here, you see the, the Kent State people, you see a policeman with a black band. In a headlock and then a, a dog attacking the, dog. The, the man. So there's a quite difference. And this is really what happened to, to all the hopes. Okay, next one. And this is her take on Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe committed suicide in 1962. And this lovely painting on, the, on that one, it's called, ironically, it's called The Only Blonde in the World. And it was 1963. Uh, uh, and she killed herself in 1962. And at the top, I want you to compare it with the Warhol. Look at the way she's treated Monroe. Now, she'd got this image from a photograph in the newspaper. So it was black and white in an image. And she's mixed it with these charming colors. Now, Monroe, it's actually a still from, from, from some like it hot. And Monroe is looking happy and cheerful and gay in her picture. Now look at the rather false, well, that sort of almost, almost like a, 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 an icon that that, the man, that Warhol does. Warhol's picture is a blue Marilyn, that's 1964. Uh, the only blonde in the world is 1962. And uh, 1963, sorry. Now underneath it, we see again, Richard Hamilton's take on this situation. He's always much more serious than the others. And what he's referring to is, is the, the, the difficulty of great celebrity, because these, this is from a, from a newspaper part that he found of Monroe's own, uh, it's her, it's photographs of herself and the ones that are going to be published and the, the crosses are the ones that she has actually discarded. And the one on the lower right is the one that she agreed to be bought. But the, the, the crosses could be seen to be kisses, I suppose, as well. It's a wonderful example, really, of, of the sadness and so on, of this sadness of, of, of celebrity, really. And it's called My Marilyn. And it was 1965. So we've got 64, 65, and 63 here. Okay, next two. Now here come perhaps the most interesting, I think, of her works. This, these are called It's a Man's World, one and two. And again, I want you to look very carefully at the images, particularly on the left. You see the references to the space threat that was going on. You, of course, see uh, Elvis Presley. And you see Lenin and Einstein at the bottom. And uh, if <laughs> later on, Penny will tell you who the... I can't remember the name of the, of the matador, but we can see that there. And underneath, right at the bottom, you see the killing of, of uh, Kennedy and her rose, her own symbol of herself in the center. Now on the right, it's a man's world too. And these are all the way that that particular period, they thought about women. Women were just objects. These were objects to be, to, 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 to literally to fuck. This is what this is all about. And this is what she's saying. These, I think, are tremendously interesting in the 1960s and 1964. Now, the end of her life was incredibly sad. I mean, put the next one on and I can, wish, I can tell you from here. Now, this one, again, is very, very much about contemporary, the contemporary popular world. This is the theme song of a BBC TV called Ready, Steady, Go. And it's five, four, three, two, one. And the host of it all was a woman called Kathy McGowan. And this is her at the bottom. But it's what it's actually saying uh, is, is, is uh, 
on the on the right there you see images of and that that is for f is so presumably it's got something to do with that now she she it really she 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 married very briefly a man called Clive Godwin who was a producer and also a, a, a involved in 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 television and she she said of him when she married him she said that he was the only man that had treated her as as a woman because what she said about herself was very very funny she said of herself that she was I, I, I thought I'd written it down. I don't know. I, I, I probably did. Let me have a look and see if I did. Because it's, she more or less says that she is, she was picked up because she was pretty and she was like a sexual object. This is basically what she says. Now, the picture on the right is a commission. This was, this was actually commissioned uh, by Kenneth Tynan, Tynan who, had, who, was, who was doing a cabaret called Old Calcutta. And he commissioned this for the backdrop, and it's called Bum, as you see. And it's the last painting she did in 1966, because she married Clive Goodwin and became pregnant. And she went for normal, as you do, to the hospital and discovered that she was absolutely covered with cancer. Now, they told her that she'd got to have radiography but the radiography would kill the, the child. And she refused, refused the radiography. She bore the child and she died five days later. And she died of cerebral hemorrhage. And the story gets even sadder because later on, Goodwin died also uh, uh, rather young, but he, he went to America and he brought up the little girl and she went into art like her, her dead mother. She was called Boaty Goodwin and she died of a heroin overdose in 1995. And this is why you've got to look at Pauline Boaty because in one way she absolutely epitomizes the, the joy and the sadness of that period. Okay, next one. Now we're going to change again. This time it's Derek Boshia. Derek Boshia is still alive, and, and this particular one is, it's probably some, something. No, no, it isn't, it's Sarah. Okay, uh, it, 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 this, is, this is, he was more interested in social issues. He was one of the people that was in this monitor program. And, but he was, he was really, his, his particular interest was his, his noticing the expansion of the American influence, particularly the posters and so on. And so this special K is, 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 a, is a reference to Kellogg's, and this was his picture. But he also is make, making some sort of reference, again, to perhaps the British were a little bit early with their interest in ordinary products. Because on the right, it's a John Bradley. Now, John Bradley was part of the kitchen sink realism and completely now ignored virtually. He was born in 28 and he died in 92. And this particular one is Jean and still life in front of a window. And as you can see, it's a breakfast table absolutely piled full of all sorts of the, uh, the American style stuff. And this is 1956. Oh, God. Right. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he, he, as I say, his criticism, basically, it's not so much criticism, but it is a sort of a, 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 an idea that he was, he was concerned that America, the American way of life was absolutely taking over England as, as we came. Now, how do I, what do I do? Do I just press that? Sorry, I don't know. No, what. no, no, it's okay. Now, here we've got, we're still on Derek Brochier. He's still on that Russia, and here he's making a reference again to America. And we're talking in this case, we're talking about the moon, the moon handed. And the title is very funny. It says, I wonder what my heroes think of the space race. He's making the difference between heroes and celebrities. And as you see, they're all images that refer 
to the new to the new fact when one, one remembers that at this time we were trying to get to the moon. And on the one on the right, of course, again, it's a reference to England's diminishing power, because the top is a sort of a, 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 a match case, and it's called England's glory, but it's a kind of joke. And it's, it's England being engulfed, really, by the Americans, and this is 1963. Now we're going to change again, we're going to change to the next person who was in this monitor, and he was called Peter Phillips. He's still alive. He was born in 1939. Incidentally, one thing they all had in common, and I should have told you this at the beginning, they were all were at the Royal College between 1959 and 1961. So, that, so we're talking about both shows we've already seen, David Hockney, also Pauline Boaty and Peter Phillips. He was, at, he was, in the, he was there at the time. He won something called the Hartness Scholarship, and this allowed him to go to America. And he kind of disappeared out of our lives in, in England because he stayed in America, he went to New York, and he showed with Lichtenstein and the American pop artist, really. And this was called The Entertainment Machine, and this is 1961. And the one on the right is really, really much darker. It's called For Men Only, starring M.M. Marilyn Monroe and B.B. Brigitte Bardot. And at the bottom, it's, it's actually from, from sort of comics, which show, show sort, of, uh, uh, sort of pornographic things, you see. And that one, that one actually was 1962. Now the person who did, it, these are the people who actually took part in that monitor, which, did, which was run by Kenneth, Kenneth Russell. Now he tried to get Hockney to join, but Hockney refused. Next one, we'll see Hockney. Now this is the first, this is the area that Hockney was taught. You remember when we saw the photograph, you saw this right at the end. And this is we boys together clinging. And this, I gather, was taken from a newspaper uh, article in which, in which two boys were literally found on, on the side of a cliff because they'd fallen down, they were clinging to the side of the cliff. But really, it is rather secretly homosexual. And this one on the right is similarly. This is called Doll Boy. And this is his admiration for Cliff, uh, Cliff Richards and the beginning of the, Cl the Queen group of singers. And this one is 61 and the other one, they're both 61. Uh, but he, he refused to do, he didn't want to join in with the others. He wasn't interested at all in pop, pop, pop art at that point. His particular images were, he was still a little interested in surrealism, particularly at this point, he'd met um, Francis Bacon and he was very much more interested in the English way of life. Now, what we're going to see now is the emergence of a new kind of art gallery. And these were by two young men, both all the same age, really, as the group we're talking about. One was called Casmin and the other one was called Robert Fraser. Casman was a family man with children, but Robert Fraser was a, was a very, very famous homosexual. Now, now we're looking, he was, his father was a banker and the money for his gallery was put up by his father. Casman got his money from, he actually was Jewish, he was an immigrant and he'd been working at Marlborough Gallery. And he, he, he got in, interested in the Marquis, or the Marquis of Dufferin became interested in him a bit. And that was the Guinness money. So it was the, the Guinness money that produced the first Casmin Gallery. And the Casmin Gallery was in Bond Street. And here it is on the left. It was a completely unknown look as far as galleries at this time were concerned, it's completely white. You entered this funny, entered in the door, you entered in this funny way, you went through this long, long passageway, and then you came into this extraordinary space, which was actually sparkling with light. And it was beautifully put together. 
and uh, but his 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 own personal interest actually he didn't like figurative art at all he liked american hard edge and so what we're actually looking at is his opening uh, one which was uh, uh, which which, which, uh, which which was kenneth noland and he preferred this one the only change was that he'd met hockney and liked hockney so hockney became one of his people and I thought it's terribly funny. The one on the lower left, of course, is a Hockney of 1963, and it's called Play Within a Play. And there it is, you see, Casmin in front of this rather strange, um, sort of almost tapestry. And the top photograph is Richard Smith, a sculptor, and uh, David Casmin uh, in the middle. And by now, of course, David Hocknick having come back from America with his blonde hair. And so this is again, it's 1963. And this, this gallery really showed all the people we're going to be talking about. Okay, next one, because the other gallery was just as important, but in a way more important, because this is where the beautiful people were assembled. Because in fact, uh, uh, Robert Fraser, was a member of the elite, I mean, Eton, etc. His father put money up. Again, he liked American painting and the grain relatively hard edge, and that's what you see in the, in the picture there. It's an exhibition of the, the American scene of 1967. Now, the, the picture on the right is important because this is one of the opening nights and all of the, everybody went there. By now, the Beatles, the Stones, and here are they're all the beautiful people, and there he is standing in the middle. Now, the photograph is by David Bailey, and David Bailey is going to be part of this, this group of beautiful people, and this is what we're looking at now. We're looking at this thing, and that's 1968. Okay, next one. Now, by now, the British establishment had not paid much attention to the growing group of of, of, of new artists realize they've got to take a bit of interest in it and so they put a bit of money into it and the and the British Council supported them and they sent the the young artist to the French Biennale of Young Artists in 1963 and standing in front of the Musée d'Art Moderne there are all of them and there they all there there's Tilson there's Blake there's Beauchier and of course, there's Hockley, and there they're all standing in front of it. Now, the picture on the right is slightly more interesting because we're going to come another very important figure of this group. And this was Brian Robertson. Now, Brian Robertson was the curator of the Whitechapel, perhaps the most important in a way. He start, I've got his dates down here. I'll sort of find it in a minute because he was. The period that we're talking about, it was at the Whitechapel that people saw all the new young artists. And what we're looking at here is a, is a still from a BBC film about a new, a new set of, of, of artists. It's called the, the, the New Generation. And here are all the participants in this one. Sitting first on the left, of course, is Bridget Riley. Beside her, there's Michael Vaughan. And then there's Patrick Proctor, and then there's Brian Robertson, and then there's a man called Huxley, Peter Huxley. Now, all of these people were part of, there were 12 artists in this exhibition, and he, he, he'd actually managed to, 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 to put it on because he'd got the, he understood about the American way of patronage, and he got involved with the manufacturer. In, this, in his particular case, it was Stuyvesant, and this was a tobacco manufacturer. Now, the, the thing that it is very distressing to tell you is that at the same time that Stuyvesant decided to put money into new art was exactly the time when they discovered that tobacco was causing cancer, uh, cancer, and, death. cancer and death. And so the money of the, the patron of all of this was, was Stuyvesant. Okay, next one. Now, here's a funny picture. 
if you saw it the big at uh, the one at the back you saw it here and this is a hockney believe it or not it's called the hypnotist and it's a very funny painting i think this one and it's 1963 and next to it of course is bridget riley blaze and bridget riley became the in a way the most acceptable of the female artists because unlike Pauline Boaty, who was commenting about how difficult it was to be a female artist and was somewhat of a feminist, and, but her images showed things that people could attack. Bridget Riley was completely abstract and so you couldn't tell her sex by looking at her pictures. This is the point really. And, this, and she became very important. The other people, who were, who were shown in that in this exhibition, I know less about. Okay, next to and I'll show you. The one on the left is Michael Vaughan, and this is an abstract of 1964. I honestly know nothing about him. He's completely disappeared almost from the face of the earth, although he's still alive. Now the gentleman on the right, I know a lot more about. And this is Patrick Proctor. Now I've cheated a bit because this picture was 1970 and so therefore painted after this exhibition, but it's very like the pictures. He was his watercolors, enormously successful. Everybody was having their, paint, their picture painted by Patrick Proctor. He basically was a watercolorist, very, very strange. And, and uh, his, his, his work is the one really that had survived and it's group. Okay, next to because on the left, there's a man called Paul Huxley and pointed out by, <clears throat> by Penny, he did become the president, I think, of the, of the, Royal, of, of the, the Royal Academy, I think. She'll tell us afterwards. And the gentleman on the right, I do know. This is John Hoyland. He was born in 34 and he died in 2013. And this is an, a, an acrylic, 1964. The reason I'm saying it's an acrylic is that this particular, by the mid 60s, people began to be interested in not only new looks, but new, new ways of painting and working with different things materials. And, and materials. And the acrylic became very, very successful. Okay, next one. Now these, these were in night, they weren't in the, 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 these were the same exhibition. And of course we know Patrick Proctor. And this is a lovely early Patrick Proctor, you see here. And, we, and this is called uh, The Girl in the Interior. He died in 2005. But the one on the right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk to, to Elaine about it because he was an Australian painter. Now, strangely, I remember his work. He was an extremely good painter. He came to England and he became part of this group. And this is Woman in the Bath of 1964. He went back to Australia. Very sadly, he had a drinking problem and also drugs. And he died very young, really, of an overdose in Australia in 1992. Now, the next one, the next person, who, of course, we all know, is Alan Jones, still alive. And he was born in 1937. And he, incidentally, was also part this Royal Academy group, 1959 and 61. And the one on the left is a litho, which did come, uh, was in the uh, 64 exhibition, but the table was not until later, that was 1969. And this of course is what we all know, know of his work. Now, Brian Robertson was determined to, to completely show new art. The tape really wasn't. The tape was sort of showing a, a bit of American art, but it had not picked up to his new young people. But he was determined in 1965, also part of the idea of new generation, he put on a sculpture show. So let's look at that one next, because this perhaps is the most extraordinary difference between 60s and the period of the past. I only mention one word. Think about Henry Moore. Think about Barbara Hepworth. They were the preceding port, uh, sculptors. And now look at the top left. The top left is very important. That is in Kasmin's gallery. And Kasmin was the first person to, to show 
Karen. And this really, really, really was extraordinary. And at the bottom of the left was the very first thing he did. He'd been in America. He went to America and he came back absolutely thrilled with the idea of, of techni uh, new techniques and new ideas. And particularly, he began to start using, as you see, pieces of iron, steel, and paint, most importantly, painted the picture of the, the art. And that's early one morning. It's now at the Tate. It's 1962. But it was Kasman who showed him first. And that's the top left. Now, he became enormously important because almost at once he was a tremendous success. And he was made the head of sculpture at St. Martin's. And he taught all the other people that we're looking at now. And he became really, he actually did change the face of sculpture in this country. There was a new interest in new materials as, new, as well as new ideas. And so the middle one is, 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 by, is by Philip King and it's called Tra La La and it's fiber and glass. He was the student of, 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 of uh, Caro as was William Tucker, the top, which was Marion II and that's painted steel. The one underneath is Tib Scott, and this is Quadrant, and this was 1965. So we're all talking about 1964, and I can't emphasize enough the difference that this made in particularly public sculpture. Okay, next to it. Now, this is one of the most interesting, and, and I think with any luck, um, Penny will tell us about it afterwards because she luckily has a copy of this almost um, impossible to get that was a new it was a, a new book that was published to express the new art and it was actually public it was edited by the same brian robertson and john russell and it was photo they were photo it was photographed by lord snowden and it was called private view and it was published in 1965. And the idea was, it was very, in those days, very expensive. It was 10 pounds. I believe you can't get, if you could get a second-hand copy, they're like 72 pounds, a price like that now. They're almost impossible. In the center, but what he did, what Snowden decided to do, was to, to, to uh, what they all decided was, to show artists in a more intimate way, basically, showing them in, within their studios, or at least in, 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 in things that the people didn't know. And of course, the center one, as we can see, that's Francis Bacon. And the, the cover is 1965. And the one on the extreme right, of course, is Bridget Riley. And she's standing in front of her contribution. It's called Contribution, and it was 1963. Okay, next one, <coughs> we see Images from the artist. Yes, please. That's a good idea. Now here, most unlikely, isn't would I would never have recognized it. That is Lucing Freud. Isn't that strange? That was 1964. Him looking contemplative and quite different. And in the middle, it's Elizabeth Frink in her studio. All of them in this book. And on the right, within his studio, is Frank Arbach. And frankly, photo Snowden just photographed Arbach when deliberately sort of in the center, you've got a sort of a, a misty thing showing sort of space really. And they all, they're all part of this. The next one is my very favorite painter, Michael Andrews, but this time he's in the his own studio in Norfolk. And he, you can see his, his stuff surrounding him. And of course, on the right, a very sweet and rather charming childlike David Hockney. And these all came from this exhibition. Now, Snowden was part of this group who always appeared at the Robert Fraser's opening, you know, now with Princess Margaret and the whole of the, these beautiful people we were talking about. Okay, next one. Because now we find America, England has become swinging London. And an Italian filmmaker has decided to make a film about swinging London. 
and it's Antonio Nick and the film, the film was Blow Up. And it was basically on a day in the life of a very fashionable photographer based almost entirely on the life of David, David, Bo of David Bailey. Now, the, the image on the extreme left is David Bailey. He was terribly attractive and photographing a model called My, uh, 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 Moira Swart and in, in the Vogue studio. In the center picture, you see Antonioni photographing um, David Hemmings, who was, became the hero called Thomas of this story in his Rolls Royce. There he is on there. And on the right, you see Casmin, you see Antonioni, and you see uh, uh, the, the uh, Carlo Ponte, who was the, uh, the producer of this, this film. In, in, in Kasman's uh, studio. Okay, next one. Now here we see some stills of the film. Now importantly, it showed you really the changing attitude towards photography, particularly fashion photography, by this new group of working class photographers, people like Donovan and specifically David Bailey. And Heming uh, and and uh, uh, David Hemmings is uh, supposed to be the there he is the, the top he's the actor and it's also with Vanessa Redgrave as well. well it wasn't I, I I didn't I didn't have any images of Vanessa Redgrave but here it is he was in he's photographing with his with his um uh, his at, at the top here and with his friend there's an interesting reference to his friend as an artist who he admires and at the bottom. There's, a, there's lovers in a place called Marion Park, which was at Greenwich. And the whole point about the film, I gather, is that a, there is a suspected murder. I, 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 I saw the film, but I don't remember it. He photographs yeah. a woman being murdered in Regent's Park. No, it wasn't. It was Marion Park. It was in Greenwich. Oh. That's what it was photographed. Oh, really? Oh. So I have done my homework. Done. Regent's Park. No, I've okay. done my homework. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's only when he blows up the that photograph in the studio is. that he notices the, the woman being murdered or disappeared or snatched or something. And the film begins with a studio rag, which I think is very interesting. This takes place, I think, in, in the slave here. And the center showing the, the extraordinary disparate life of a fashionable photographer, because the center is, is him coming out of a, of a DOS house with the poor. He'd been photographing the, the, the people who didn't have any money the same day. And at the bottom, it shows you the, the new extreme sexuality of the fashionable photographs because it's David Hemmings photographing a famous model at the time, a woman called Veruska. And as you see, he's actually on top of her and she's on the floor there. And the one on the right, the picture on the right is Antonio uh, 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 with his viewfinder actually photographing the picture. Okay, the picture became Swinging London. Now we see what the fashion world took from, swing, swing, from the art world, particularly Mary Quant. Mary Quant was not happy about this, but there you go. At the beginning, you see movement in square. Sorry, Bridget Riley. Well, I said Mary Quant. Sorry, it, I'm talking about Mary Quant when she takes over Bridget Riley because Bridget Riley on the left is, is, is 1961 and it's called Movement in Squares. And in the center, in this case, it's a French designer who takes over the, the Riley images. And this particular one, he's called Courage. It's Andre Courage, and this is 1965. But the two, the two plastic raincoats on the right are by Mary Quant, and this is for the, for the, the firm called Alligator, and it's their PVC jackets, also new materials in 1965. And they, they're also references to, as I say, 
uh, but Riley's work. She wasn't very happy about it. Okay, <laughs> next to. Now, we really are becoming, England is becoming, London particularly, there's three places in the world that people look for art, Paris, New York, and now London. And there's no doubt about it, that suddenly we're on Wilson, we're in Wilson's government, and they suddenly realize that they have to take a bit of notice of the arts, because it's the arts really who are helping the culture, are helping the, 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 the economy of the country, particularly by 1966, because this is when Time magazine is encouraging all the Americans to come to swinging London. And you see, you see Alfie at the back there, you see? All of these things, the bingo, was an, or the, the image of all the people here. And that is, that issue is 1966. And on the right, it's the French issue, Paris Match, showing Carnaby Street in 1967. And suddenly, London is the place that all the young want to come to. It is the swinging London. Okay, next one. And this is a wonderful photograph of a girl in Mary Quant, of course, standing in front or being lifted in front of a Reichenberg exhibition at, of course, the Whitechapel in 1964. And this was reproduced in a magazine produced specifically specifically for export. It was in 1964 and it finished in 1967. And there it is. The model is in the front of the Marschenberg in 1964. And this is the magazine, the, 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 the front of the magazine in which this picture appeared. Okay, next two. And here are more images from on the left here and in the middle from the same magazine. And, and uh, this, is, this is sort of creative Britain. And the sculpture is by a man called Clive, Pol uh, Clive Barker. And here you see it in the image, and this is the actual sculpture that we see. But on the right, this is from the, the Sunday Times again. And this, of course, is an advert for tobacco. It's Will's tobacco. And it is Peter Blake advertising art and advert, uh, advertising has suddenly become connected. Look at, it, look at the image of Blake, and it says, smoke cigars, he practically paints with them. And suddenly the connection between art and money is now becoming very apparent. Okay, next one. More so than you can imagine, because this particular group, this supported by, of course, the British Council, this is America, London going to America. This is the British boutique in Texas, in Neiman Marcus in 1967. And on the right from the same image, it's Mary Quant, the scene, which is a scene at Chelsea, and it's also in the same boutique. This is swinging London. Film, music, poetry, painting, are all coming under the same level. Okay, next one. And here we have lovely Twiggy, this time photographed by another um, working class boy called Terence Donovan in 1966. And in the centre, Alfie, 1966. And of course, Michael Caine who we now know. This is why we put, told you, if you can, pick up the outfit, the, 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 the film. The, the My Doctor, Generation. My Generation, the documentary, but it's absolutely wonderful. And this is George Harrison and Patty Boyd, 1966. They were briefly married, only not for very long, but they're absolutely typical. He's wearing the kind of clothes that we'll see. If you go to this exhibition, you will see in these clothes, and they're by a group of, 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 of men, of several young people now taking it from several row. Okay, next one. Now, here we have perhaps the epitome of high 60s, and of course, it's Peter Blake 
doing the cover for Beatles, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That's 1967. But in 19, I think it's in 1967, I've forgotten actually the date, I will look it up, but they go to India. They, they, the, 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 the lot of them, the, they, they, trot, they trot off to India. I've forgotten what date mm, it is. It's to meet, uh, isn't it Ravi Shankar? That's right, Ravi Shankar. And they come back really rather more serious. 1968. 1968, exactly. So they, they come back and they commission, of course, Richard Hamilton to do a cover. And what does Richard Hamilton do? He does the white cover. The white album. The white album. And inside, there's just this set, this strange sort of uh, oh, collage sure. of all of their all of their activities. Quite quite different. You're beginning now to see a slight sense of 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 a change in this this group. Okay, next one. Now this, I, these I think are quite fantastic. Now I cheated with the one in the center, but I couldn't resist it. Now the two on the, the one in the beginning and at the end, of course they're David Hockney. And this is David Hockney, a room in Manchester Square, and it's Patrick Proctor. Patrick Proctor, this incredibly fashionable painter. And in the center, and I am cheating a bit. He was born in 36 and he died in 2006. And it's his picture of Pin Prince Charles in 1987. It's so funny, I thought you had to look at it. And of course, the one on the right, he'd already been to Los Angeles. He's dyed his hair. He's become the very fashionable British painter. And this is called A Bigger Splash. And so here we have the change. Okay, next two. Now we have the sense of slight concern about this commercial world, this commercial life that's taken over the art world. And this very interesting man called John Latham, who was born in 1921, he died in 2006. He began to express it. Strangely enough, Kasman was a great friend of his, and he showed his work surprisingly in, 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 the, in, in, in his gallery. He was an intellectual. He had a degree in history. And his interest was really showing, criticizing, particularly the Enlightenment. And these, the destroyed books with a, a plaster in 1967, and they are, they're now in the Tate. And the book on the right is the same in the 60s. And, and they're, 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 they are burned books. He invented an, what he called Scoob, which was books backwards, the backward word. And he, he made them into towers, which we'll look at in a minute. He became very friendly with a very interesting man called Gustav Metzer. I'm going to pass you over to my friend on the right who knows much more about, she did her PhD in, in, in destruction. So we will have a look. <laughs> you could talk about him. It was, well, it was about, called a, a Destructive Art? It was called Destructive Art. And the exhibition was in 19... 1966. 66, because it was in, in London. And Metzger was the one that collected oh. a bunch of artists at the time who were using the pro a process of destruction in their art um so they were actively engaging with like a, a, any type of of sort of trauma to a material as part of their artistic process and the whole point of this was to reflect at the time the kind of the conflicts that were going on socially politically yeah, yeah. and economically so whether it was protesting whether it was you know war the vietnam war the cold war um, well, for example, in 1960, can I just? Yeah, I, no, I, I, you have here, a timeline. There. I've got yeah. a timeline which is quite worth, quite worth it. They were beginning; the drug thing was beginning, and uh, uh, they, 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 they were all smoking at Robert Fraser. Well, there was and a lot of experimentation was, with yes, like LSD, yeah. um, 
several different drugs at the time to kind of like open one's consciousness, open one's mind. Um, there, there, there have been sort of problems about this always. Um, and and the, the clubs, and, uh, of course, were all about this. And, uh, and uh, uh, the Sexual Offensive Act, remember this, in 1967, this is the first time that homosexuals could lawfully go together. Before this, they were put in prison. So all of this was happening at the same time. Okay, next two. It's very important, this. Okay, next one. Oh, okay. The other thing, the last thing to mention was, Metzger. though, that Metzger's exhibition in 66, Six. later was so, the movement was like so uh, uh, sort of well-received at the time that it actually went to New York. And in 68, there was a, uh, auto destructive art exhibition I established did. in New York at really? the time. Really? They sort of tapped into um, artists at the time. They had more, of course. Yeah, that were using, again, decay, material destruction, conflict as part of their artistic process. Here he is, here in front of his, 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 his the place that he was showing it. And here he is actually doing it. And he's destroying uh, with acid, plastic. Mm -hmm plastic piece. That's Metzger. That's Metzger. And he was very active throughout the rest of his life until his death. So in the 90s, he was, you know, leading rallies, protesting um, about UK armaments, nuclear uh, war. Uh, bomb, nuclear war. He was this quite is, an amazing character. Okay, we're, we're, we're now seeing the change. Okay, next one. Okay, because here we see something terribly important. These are John Latham's uh, uh, actual uh, his 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 scoop towers and they were very very tall now interestingly they were shown in in public places for example they were shown outside the law courts the british museum the houses of parliament and senate house and then he set fire to them and this is what we're looking at here and this is 1966 the first one here outside the british museum now the center one is being taken up by, by contemporary because this is a 2017 uh, um, uh, exhibition at the, at the Serpentine of him. And this is what he looked like uh, late, uh, uh, at that particular point. And the box, which now is given to the Tate, this box contains all of the problems. Now one of the, this, this is much, much earlier. This was 1967. And this is in response to a, a book called Art and Culture by Clement Greenberg, in which he disparaged the British artists. And he was going for, we all know about Greenberg, he was very much a form and colour person. And what is really rather disgusting, that he persuaded the students to tear the book into pieces, chew it up, and spit it out and put it in those bottle jars, which went sort of, and that's what on those bottles there. This is his disgust of, of this particular way of life. I'm afraid this is very strange, but it does express the period. It's enormously important by now because we're now talking to, 19, to 1968. And 1968, my goodness me, it's going to be, the uh, this is when this is when by the way the 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 the, 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 the uh, apple thing was a letter of the year and february uh, what, the, the, the apple computer was invented the, the apple the, the yes at this time i think okay. and uh, also here the beatles go to india in 1968 and uh, they, they opened a quorum fashion show and all of this and, and the, the Beatles' white album was 1968 as well. Okay, next to I thought you'd have this earlier, because this is what the result was, and this is what is incredibly important. This is when the students revolt. Now, do you remember me telling you right at the beginning that what has happened that made this really possible was this sudden infusion of new, new people, i.e. the working class, went to university. Now one of the disappoint one of the most problematical things about this was you were so many people now got the were all went to university 
but the actual spaces in which they went to were over, uh, completely overwhelmed. This happened in Paris and the students absolutely reacted. It became very violent. And in, in Paris, in, in France, it became very political, particularly anti-Vietnam. We was the same, but in England, that we had this funny little exhibition, this funny little riot in Hornsey, and it was the Hornsey School of Art. I have to admit that when I was a student, it was a school that I went to, I may say, long before this. Now, what had happened in Hornsey was, what happened was, they, again, too many students, and there was not enough space for them, because Hornsey, literally on Crouch Hill, is a tiny little space, and there were very small rooms, and suddenly all of these people had, there was no room for them in their main school. So they literally took over all sorts of places in Crouch Inn. You know, there were bits of them in Alexander Paris and bits of them somewhere else. The result of which was that there was no sense that there was no, there was no community and the students revolted. And they particularly revolted against, against their, 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 a very, very strong problem. Because what had happened is that the government or, or, or the council had decided to associate the art schools with polytechnics. And there was an absolute dread, dread about this. They did this in 1957. And by 1961, they were absolutely furious about it. And then they, ch they, 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 they changed that and they called it the ATD. Now, in order to get to the ATD, you had to have A-levels, et cetera, et cetera. And quite literally, what we're looking at is the end of the old art school. As far as I know, virtually the only place now that, you t that, that teaches art in the traditional way is places like the Slade. On the whole, they've become part of the university. This means that the, the, the subjects they're teaching are quite different and the students were revolting about that. Okay, next one, because here you see them talking about it in the list now. And you'll see, you see it there, so this is the revolting students and so on. And on the right, you see the students' little, little poster against it, which was against actually the, 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 the Muswell Hill Council. That was what it was. It wasn't, but it was a very quiet one by comparison. But of course they lost. And as I say, very sadly, the old art schools that we all knew, in fact, when you went in there, you drew, you drew from, the, from the antique. And when you were very lucky, you were allowed in to draw in the life room. And it was all about learning to draw with understanding in the old art schools. No more. Okay, next two because now we're seeing the change. 19, as I've said, the most important figure was Anthony Carroll. But by 1967, the students of St. Martin's were fed up with Anthony Carroll. They were fed up with the idea of me the me mechanical, you know, pieces of steel and stuff, and they wanted to get back to something else. They wanted to use images use things that had not been before. And so what we're looking at on the left here, which is terribly interesting, we're looking at Barry Flanagan, and most importantly, the change, of course, is Richard Long, who now begins to give up art altogether. And he goes for walks, and he takes photographs of them. And this is one of the very, very first ones. The new materials, this is, this is a, a lining oak shot and it was photographed in 1968. And of course, on the far right, what do you see? But you see Gilbert and George, they are people sculptures. And, and, and this is, this is, there's no, this is swinging, this is, this is a Gilbert and George, the living sculpture of 1970. And they're standing with their faces painted gold, singing underneath the arches. And, all of the hope has disappeared. And it's terribly, terribly sad because all, it, it all closes, really. Uh, the, 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 the end, really, is, is by 1970. Okay, 
Next one. And here is the last one. There's the photograph of, of what in fact was, was a, 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 the police raiding <coughs> the home of, of I, 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 I had this view. Oh yes, the police raided the, uh, kept Keith Richards West Sussex home where he and his guests, including Mick Jagger, Marianne Faithful, Robert Fraser, and all taking LSD, and the police searched the premises, and the result was the infamous trial of Jagger and Richard and Fraser. And, and, and at the same time, the film blow up what? And this is, the, this is the photograph in the newspaper of that event. There's Robert Fraser and Mick Jagger. And on the right, there's the, the later um, uh, Richard Hamilton, uh, 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 a picture of, of called Living Scott. Uh, th th this particular picture is, is, is called Sw Swinging London of 1968-69. And that's it. <laughs>